So we are continuing in our series on Franz Rosenzweig and the return to Judaism. Uh, it's been a break of a few weeks since we since we last met, uh, but we are picking up tonight, uh, exploring how Rosenzweig conceived of this idea of the way in which German Jews would return to Judaism through the lens of Jewish learning. Um, in the early series, early parts of the uh, of the series, we were focusing on. Rosenzweig's own personal narrative of the return to Judaism and how he theologically conceives of the significance of that return uh, to Judaism, um, this idea of hearing God's call, experiencing God's love, feeling oneself drawn inexorably to Judaism, keep finding yourself bound to Judaism, you can't really escape it, even if you're not even somebody who considers yourself to be a believer, but you still are drawn to it um, inexorably, inevitably. Uh, and then the last session, we looked at the way Franz, Franz Rosenzweig conceives of the Jewish condition in modernity and, and what does it mean to even re return to Judaism. Uh, and as we saw, he recognizes that modern Jewish life has caused a fundamental rupture from the Jewish experience before it. Where before modernity, Judaism had this sort of lived organic feel to it, the unity of the, of the synagogue, the home, and, and, and Jewish law, which created these sort of sense of, of, of wholeness and, and community that modernity comes and kind of smashes that to pieces. And as far as Franz Rosenzweig is concerned, there's no real easy or simple way to put those pieces back together. And as we saw last time, he criticizes both reform and orthodoxy for the way they have turned Judaism and modernity into a sort of ideology um, that he sees as sort of going against the authentic nature of Judaism. With reform, it's obvious, right? How they've sort of eliminated halakha, which is one of the three planks of, of Judaism as Rosenzweig saw it, how they've basically eliminated Judaism from the home and what's left is the shul, but the Judaism that exists in the reform shul isn't, isn't, isn't so much. Orthodoxy, at least it has attempted to hold all three pieces together, but Rosenzweig's concern is the way that orthodoxy has become more of a political entity than you might say even a religious entity. The halacha is less about sort of the way it should be and more about trying to hold to certain political ideals as a way of defining who's in and outside the orthodox, uh, the orthodox community. And even orthodoxy has attempted to sort of justify its beliefs and try to show why it's completely rational and reasonable to believe and Rosenzweig also is, is a bit skeptical of that enterprise because at least as he understands it, it, Judaism isn't something that you believe in, that you follow, that it's part of you because you have these reasons for it, because you can justify it, because it's rational, right? You're a Jew because you're born a Jew. I mean, that's what the, that's what the Gemara says. That's, that's what the Jewish tradition says. So this question of how we're going to rationalize it or justify it, which even Orthodox tries to do, Rosenzweig sees as being far into the uh, to the spirit of, uh, of of Judaism. And over the next today and over the next several sessions, we'll, we're going to look at how, again, Rosenzweig understands what does it mean to return to Judaism and how we exactly we do that. Tonight, it'll be through, through Jewish learning, through Torah study, Talmud Torah. We'll look at and see how Rosenzweig understands the return to Judaism through halacha, through, through Jewish law. Um, and then we'll also look at how he understands the return to Judaism through uh, his own reconception of the Torah itself, especially one that's a bit more radical than maybe the uh, the traditional conception or the traditional Orthodox conception of of Torah. But given that tonight or today is Hanukkah, I think it's definitely worth sort of highlighting the unique connection between Rosenzweig's own thinking about the return to Judaism and Hanukkah, because there's a, there's actually a lot of similarities there. The first thing I'll point out is that Hanukkah is a holiday which commemorates the attempts of the Greeks not to destroy the Jewish people, right? It's not Purim, in which Haman wanted to destroy us. It's not even Pesach, in which the Egyptians wanted to enslave us or physically enslave us. Hanukkah is primarily about commemorating the Greeks' attempt to assimilate us, right? To basically get us to give up Judaism. Um, and the reason that's so significant, I think, is because we all kind of know this. In many ways, Hanukkah is the most modern of Jewish holidays because the dilemma of Hanukkah of being caught between the world of Judaism and the world of the Greeks is not that different from the dilemma that we all find ourselves in today. 
living in both the world of Judaism and the world of Torah, but also living in the modern world and being an American and, and engaging in the secular world and taking the secular world and its, its values and its culture very seriously. Right? So the dilemma of Hanukkah, perhaps more than any other of the holidays, is one that we can, that we can honestly relate to. And I think what's particularly significant for, for us as we think about Hanukkah and, and Rosenzweig is that to a large extent, um, if Hanukkah was the attempt to assimilate the Jews, to cause them to sort of lose their connection to God and to Torah, then modernity has succeeded where the Greeks failed, right? The Greeks tried and failed, right? Modernity has actually achieved what the Greeks actually wanted to do to a large extent by bringing about such a wholesale assimilation of the, of the Jewish people into, into a secular culture. And um, this idea of the Greeks and their desire to assimilate the Jews, it, it's, it's actually rooted in, in Midrashic ideas. And it's just interesting because just the, the kind of language that's used here, because it sort of frames where Franz Rosenzweig and many of the Jews and German Jews in his time and where m- many Jews today find themselves. So the, the Midrash of Bereshit Rabba, when it comments on the opening verses of, of Bereshit, Parshat Bereshit, right? There's the famous verse in which it says, Right, the, the earth was sort of chaos and, and, and the void. And what the Midrash sees here is that this verse is actually describing the future exiles of the Jewish people. Uh, and the, the, the different words in the verse that rabbis actually interpret as signifying the four exiles the Jewish people will be in. Right, the first exile, the Ar, it, it interprets each word it, it, according to a different exile. The Ar takes that tohu zegalut baba. Right, the first exile is the Babylonian exile. First temple is destroyed. Jews go into exile in Babylonia. The second um, uh, exile, which says here, uh, uh, which says here, tohu vehine atohu uvohu zegalut madai. Right, the tohu is Babel. The um, Vohu is Madai, Madai is Persia, right? So that's the second exile. The Persians conquer the Babylonians and we live under exile and under the Persians after the Babylonians, right? The story of Esther is the story of the Jewish exile in Persia as opposed to Babylonia, but it's the same essential place, just same place, different owners, so to speak. Um, and then Choshech, which is the third exile, Zegalut Yavan, right? That is the exile of, of the Greeks. And that is the, the exile, so to speak, that we commemorate or remember on the holiday of Hanukkah. And again, the Greeks here is with Chosha, which means darkness. And the way the Romans understand this is as follows. The was it that the Greeks really wanted to do? That the Greeks darkened the eyes of the Jews with their persecutorial decrees. Shaita uh, omeret lehem. That the Greeks basically uh, um, said to the, Jew, to the Jewish people that you should write it on a horn, on like the horn of an ox, that you, the Jewish people, no longer have a portion uh, in the God of Israel. That the, the whole goal of the Greeks is to bring darkness to the Jews, to separate them from God and from, and from Torah, right? By basically making it very hard to maintain Jewish identity and Jewish practice in Israel uh, during that stretch when they were, when the Greeks were pushing these decrees upon the, uh, upon the Jews. So as I said, we, we know the story of Hanukkah. We know the Hashmonaim, the Maccabees rise up and they beat the Greeks and the Assyrian Greeks and they reclaim Jewish identity and they purify the temple and they reconnect the Jewish people uh, with Torah. Um, and one of the primary rabbinic metaphors for the victory of the Jewish people over the Greeks is, less so a victory on the battlefield and more so a victory of Torah. For the rabbis, the menorah in the Beit HaMikdash is a symbol for the light of Torah. Um, Torah or, right? This is, appears in Sukim and verses, right? The light of Torah. Uh, so what the rabbis see us celebrating on Hanukkah, the light of the miracle, the light of the victory is the enduring light of Torah. This connection between us and God that can't be broken, even though that's what the Greeks wanted to do. And if that's what we celebrate on Hanukkah, unfortunately, when we celebrate Hanukkah today, right, there's something a bit ironic about the fact that for a lot of Jews, like I said, modernity has achieved what the Greeks could not. Um, Where the Greeks said, you don't have a portion in the God of Israel anymore, 
that's a statement a lot of Jews today basically affirm wholeheartedly. We don't care about the God of Israel. We're living in the secular world. And in a certain sense, I'm not the first person to point this out, there's a great irony that the most widely practiced holiday by people who are barely Jewish is Hanukkah. Because Hanukkah is all about celebrating the fact we're not going to assimilate. And yet that's exactly the Jews who celebrate right, Hanukkah. But what I'd like to take from it, at least for today, is this idea that we celebrate on Hanukkah is the notion of the light of Torah. That's what the Jews have to hold on to if they want to retain a connection uh, to God and to, um, uh, and, and to Torah. And in fact, there's a famous midrash, a very important midrash, which says, uh, where God says essentially to the Jewish people that you can abandon me, but you can't abandon the Torah. With the assumption being that as long as the Jewish people retain a connection to the Torah, they'll find their way back to God again. Uh, but if the Jewish people abandon the Torah, then there's simply no way to find themselves back, you know, connecting back to God. And I think for, for Rosenzweig and his educational efforts, right, he sees the Jewish people's connection, the Jewish individual's connection to Torah, to the words of Torah, to the letters of Torah, uh, as being the basic, basic building blocks that will enable a Jew um, to, 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 to pave that path that will enable them to find their way back uh, to Torah and to God and to the, to the Jewish, uh, Jewish collective once more. So that victory of Hanukkah, which is a victory of Torah against assimilation, is very much in the spirit of what uh, Rosenzweig was trying to, uh, uh, to accomplish. And when we look at Rosenzweig's thinking about how learning, how about Talmud Torah, how that brings us back to God and to the Jewish people, what we have to keep in mind is that his major educational effort, and we, I think I talked about this before, is the founding of the Lair House in Frankfurt. It's basically an adult Beit Midrash, a Beit Midrash for adults to come and learn, to come and learn serious texts, to come and Jews of all kinds to come and, come and learn. One of the more fascinating things about the Lair House in Frankfurt is that Jews who were Orthodox, Reform, and conservative, so to speak, all came. It wasn't just limited primarily for more secularly oriented Jews, but they were not the only ones uh, who came there. Uh, and uh, um, this Lair, the Lair House was in some ways fantastically successful, which it drew in a very large and significant portion of the adult Jews in Frankfurt to come study there. Uh, and there was something about the way the learning was done there, as we're going to see, that was really very powerful and enabled Jews to return to Torah and in doing so, as I said, return to God and, and, and return to the Jewish collective as a, uh, a, as, as a whole. Um, just to, again, pick up a little bit of what we talked about last time, uh, to reconnect it to the idea of Jewish learning and, and why it's so important for Rosenzweig. In the last year, we fo focused on what you might call Rosenzweig's sociological critique of modern Judaism. He argues over the course of various essays that with the advent of modernity, there has been a shattering of the Jewish world of which the three main components, the home, Jewish law, and the synagogue have all sort of fragmented. Reform Judaism, through its embrace of German culture, has left the Jewish home without much Judaism uh, and has abandoned Jewish law almost entirely. It leaves the synagogue standing, but more as a place one spends a couple of hours a week rather than the synagogue being the beating heart of, of a living community. Orthodoxy has attempted to hold on to the three components, uh, the home, Jewish law, and the synagogue, but it often finds itself stretched beyond its limits. Right? It's hard to contain the Jewish home and the synagogue in the broader world, when the broader secular world is just so different from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, from the Jewish world. And there's times where orthodoxy is stretched beyond its limit. That's, he's talking about his time, but we can often feel that in our own time too. German neo-orthodoxy, German modern orthodoxy embraces German culture uh, and halacha becomes more of a political tool that determines who's in and out of orthodoxy rather than an authentic way to live a religious life. Uh, in relationship uh, uh, with God. And what Rosenzweig says, and we saw this last time, but as I said, it's it, worth repeating because I think it's such a powerful statement, that when Rosenzweig envisions this idea of return, there's no set image in mind of what the Jew is supposed to look like at the end of it, right? Rosenzweig believes in Torah, he believes in mitzvot, but he also doesn't feel that one can stake out exactly what that's supposed to look like. And the attempt to define what that's actually supposed to look like in some way is, is, is problematic. He says, all recipes, whether Zionist or Orthodox or liberal, produce caricatures of men that become more ridiculous the more closely the recipes are followed. 
And a caricature of a man is also a caricature of a Jew. There was one recipe alone that can make a person Jewish. That recipe is to have no recipe. When Rosenzweig says Judaism has no recipes, it's not an invitation to relativism. He's not saying, well, and you be a Jew however you want, or any kind of Jew is as good as any other kind of Jew. Um, that's not what he's saying. Judaism has fundamental elements to it without which Judaism would be incomprehensible, right? There's still these central pillars of what makes Judaism Judaism. As I said, Torah, Halacha, the synagogue. Um, he, he points out here this, this idea of breed, of covenant, is truly foundational uh, for Rosenzweig. So it needs these core ideas. It needs mitzvot. It needs halacha. But the exact details of what that looks like, and if you assume that to return to Judaism means, okay, I can give you a recipe. I can give you a detailed outline of exactly how you're supposed to live your life. That's, that's a problem for Rosenzweig. Because instead of engendering this authentic relationship to Torah, um, which is a natural one, and, and, and to, well, a mitzvah that is a natural one, you are essentially offering people like a pre-programmed version of what Judaism is, is supposed to look like, which means that they're not becoming it because they, 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 they are drawn, truly drawn to it, or they, even because they choose it freely, they're becoming it because that's what the community tells them to do, or that's what the authority figure, the rabbi tells them. The rabbi tells them, this is what a Jew looks like, this is what you got to do, and that's what they do. They're, not, they're only doing it because the rabbi said so, or because the community says so. And that, for Rosenzweig, is not the, the way Judaism is, is, is to be understood. Judaism is something that becomes a natural, a, 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 uh, um, a natural way of integrating Jewish life into who we are, not something, as I said, that can be pre-programmed, predetermined, or, or, or just give it over as like a, a recipe or, or an ideology, which is all too commonly the case, right? Denominations come up with recipes for what Judaism is supposed to look like. We know this. And, and for Rosenzweig, that is a deeply, deeply uh, dangerous, dangerous thing. Um, again, he doesn't abandon the need for core principles or halacha, but we're not like entering the process of thinking about what it means to return to Judaism with a clear sense of what the destination is, uh, is, supposed, to, uh, is supposed to look like. Now, as I said before, for Rosenzweig, the key piece here, the engine of this return to Judaism is learning. Now, on the one hand, this is kind of like obvious, right? We're Jews. That's what we do. We learn. Like, it doesn't matter whether you're religious. It doesn't matter whether you're secular, right? Jews have this sense that learning, uh, that education uh, is important. It's fundamental. It's just what it means to be a Jew and however it's conceived. Meaning, when Rosenzweig says there's no recipes about what it means to be Jewish, it's very hard to imagine somebody saying that there could be Judaism without learning like Judaism without a focus on education. Like that's almost as foundational as any other idea we could come up with about what it means to be Jewish, only because the Torah as this thing that we engage, spend a lifetime engaged with and learning um, is so central. Like, you know, how could you be Judaism? How can you be Jewish with, without that, right? And the Torah, it says, right, you, you all know this because we recite it as part of the Shema, right? Right, that being a Jew, being in a relationship with God means learning, learning in order to teach, in order to, to keep the mitzvot, in order to do the mitzvot, right? Like, it's not just that we learn in order to do, but that we learn in, in order to teach, in order to, to keep and preserve, in order to do, right? It, learning is the en engine of everything. The rabbi say, Talmud Torah, connected kulam, right? The mitzvot of Talmud Torah is the equivalent of all the other mitzvot. Um, that's just so central to, to who we are. Um, and in Rosenzweig's own time, he recognizes that there is a unique opportunity for Jewish learning as a way to help Jews return to Judaism, not just because Jews like to learn, but specifically because adult education, which is really a new phenomenon in Germany and in Europe, right? There wasn't really this concept of adults at a certain age continuing their learning and doing it, you know, because they want to, because they like to, right? That's kind of a new modern idea. But when Rosenzweig sees that as a concept um, throughout Germany and beyond, he recognizes there's, there's a moment in which adult education can serve to connect Jews back to, to Judaism. And this, again, echoes with our own time, right? Adult education is a big thing today, right? There's an awareness that if somehow a Jew missed the opportunity to learn when they're young, 
that's okay. We can create opportunities for them to learn when they when they get older. Um, I mean, we know that in Cleveland, there's a ton of adult education opportunities. And uh, even today, right, with the internet, with Shireen, with video Shireen, right, the opportunity to learn at any age just expands exponentially. And the desire to learn is there. I mean, people have the time to learn today. They have the inclination to learn. That's something pretty special, right? 300 years ago, a person did not have the time to go learn on their own in their free time, either because they didn't have a lot of free time or, you know, come the nighttime, they're not easily going out to learn, right? Like we have the ability to do this in ways that simply weren't available. And what happens is that Rosenzweig has this unique opportunity in 1920 to become the director of the Lair House in Frankfurt. The Lair House is gonna be this center of adult uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish learning. Um, and it's part of this broader phenomenon of adult education. And Rosenzweig realizes there's a, a possibility here, right? Not just that we, education is so important, but there's a unique moment where there are adults who are open to learning and we can capitalize upon that. Uh, we, can take it, we can take advantage of that, he thinks, in, in, in Germany. So this is from one of his essays as he's taking over as the head of the Lairhouse. And here's how he sees what, how the Lairhouse should function. He says, the adult, Jewish adult education movement is the latest and perhaps most important movement among contemporary German Jews. Meaning he realizes adult ed in, for, for German Jews is a big deal, right? That there's an opportunity to touch a lot of people with this. But it must make clear to itself what it intends to do, right? But it's gotta be conscious and intentional about what it's doing. Like, what, what is it really trying to achieve? Exploiting the big city public's insatiable hunger for lectures, it can fill the enormous gaps in Jewish education by supplying what religious instruction neglected and what universities failed to offer, right? Jewish Hebrew school did a terrible job and universities don't often have the best, you know, Jewish studies. So this is where uh, adult Jewish education can, can serve a really, really important role. Um, and what's interesting here too, what you see is that, well, Rosenzweig is this profound philosopher. He's got this deeply pragmatic side, which is kind of unusual for somebody that's as great a thinker as him. He recognizes there's a practical opportunity here, meaning he's not just thinking, ah, oh, philosophically learning is the most important thing. It is really important, but he's also saying to himself, oh, we've got a moment here, we've got an opportunity, we've got you know, butts in the seats, we can grab people, we can get their attention, they're open to this. And he really, um, he really wants to take advantage of that. Now, he recognizes that when German Jews want to learn more about Judaism, that at a certain level, it's a, really an opportunity for cultural education, right? Meaning the Jews who are coming to this adult ed stuff, they're not coming to have like their souls awakened, right? They're coming for like, what you might call infotainment, right? They want to be entertained. They want to learn more. They want to learn more about their culture, their history. Um, it's often an act of ethnic pride, right? Like you want to learn more about Judaism. You want to feel proud about your Judaism. It's, or it's like going to the theater. You want to have a night. You want to be entertained. You want to hear the, the lecturers from the, uh, you know, the important speakers. So all, all of these are the sort of tangible goals of adult education. But Rosenzweig is obviously looking for something deeper. He's not just looking to create the lair house so he can do some fun lectures. He really has deeper, deeper philosophical and spiritual uh, goals in mind. Um, again, for a lot of the German Jews who are gonna show up, right? for them, this is an opportunity to hear the, hear the important Jewish scholar, to, to discover how fascinating Jewish history is. Um, again, it's to, to make them feel good about being Jewish without having all the baggage of religious services or the synagogue because lectures can be done anywhere. That's why Jews are going. Um, as I said, German Jews receive very little in the way of any kind of formal Jewish education. Their Jewish education was really no better than like what the Hebrew school education in America is today, which is like just a couple hours a week. That, that's it at most. Uh, in truth, even if German Jews had wanted a greater Jewish education outside of, outside of German Orthodoxy, they would simply have been no place for it. And if you wanted a, a, a serious, if you want to give your kids a serious Jewish education in Germany and you're not Orthodox, there's like nothing. There just, it doesn't exist. The university only offers academic Judaism, uh, not the kind of Judaism relevant or meaningful to the lives of, of even the secular Jews in, in Germany. So th this being the background, there's an opportunity here for adult ed. So what exactly should be studied? What, 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 what should be the course of learning at the warehouse? So he says, it would probably have to offer as complete a series of courses as possible, a curriculum as encyclopedic as possible. In other words, an education, right? He really wants the Lairhouse to offer like Kola Torah Kula, 
not like as we say, the entirety of Torah. He wants to give over the comprehensiveness of Torah and of Jewish life. He doesn't want it to be limited just to Jewish history or just to sort of narrow topics. He really wants to give over the breadth and depth of Judaism, because if you're not doing that, you're not really going to be able to connect people to, to, uh, to something deeper. He says it would become merely a substitute in the long run for something that should normally be offered elsewhere, but cannot because the living force, uh, the center and germ cell of Jewish life is wanting. But the mo movement in question might try to become this very center of a Jewish life. It might try to become the form of such a life, but certainly only the first empty immediate form. So Rosenzweig recognizes that ideally Jewish education should not be limited to adult education. The whole situation that he's working with is, as we say in halacha, it's after the fact. It's a non-ideal situation. It would obviously be better to focus Jewish educational efforts on children. But since there are no opportunity for robust Jewish youth education in Germany, whatever day schools that exist are orthodox, uh, adult learning will have to serve at least as a temporary starting point. Rosenzweig wants the learning to be comprehensive, touching on many different topics, because that's the only way to convey to German Jews that Judaism consists of a life world. It's not just, like I said, narrow subjects, not just history, it's not just philosophy, it, it's, it's a whole way of being in the world. It's not just going to shul on Shabbat or just three times a year in a Pesach Seder. Judaism encompasses all the dimensions of human experience. It's its own world, and this is what grants Jewish identity its vital force, that, that it is representative of a whole world. One's Judaism is not dependent on a set of beliefs, but rather draws its strength from a comprehensive literature and way of life, and that's what the Lairhouse is going to try to convey. Judea German Judaism lacks a Jewish life world, that connection between, again, home, halacha, and the synagogue, but Rosenzweig has hopes that adult learning can reignite the possibility of it. And it's important to recognize that for Rosenzweig, having lots of adult education programs is not an end unto itself. It's only the means to an end, the beginning, as he goes on to say. I mean, the goal here is not just to get all as many Jews as you can to come and learn, right? The goal is, as we're going to see, is to get them to, you know, really have an awakening, to really connect uh, on a much, much, much deeper, deeper level. Uh, Rosenzweig goes on, he says, it would try to be a beginning the warehouse. Uh, it's not an end unto itself. Learning is just the beginning. Instead of confronting the seeker of knowledge with a planned hole to enter step by step, it would keep itself a mere modest beginning, the mere opportunity to make a beginning. Nothing more? Yes, nothing more. Have confidence for once. Renounce all plans. Wait. People will appear who prove by the very fact of their coming to the discussion room of a school of a Jewish adult education, will someone suggest a better word, that the Jewish human being is alive in them. Otherwise, they would not come. So what you're, what you're seeing echoed here is again the idea that Judaism cannot provide recipes, be they Orthodox, Reform, or Zionist, even though that is always the temptation when it comes to education. It's fundamental for Rosenzweig that Jewish learning, at least for those on the start of their Jewish journey, be somewhat open-ended, right? And this runs against the whole modern inclination to try to spell everything out. Right. Even today, one sees this very strongly in any new Jewish educational endeavor, especially those attempting to bring Jews who are distant closer to Judaism. Funders always want to know um, what the plan is. Right? Here's where they're starting. How are you going to get them from A, B, C to Z? Or how are you going to get them all the way to where you want them to go? Right. There's an expectation from the moment you start teaching. Right. How are you going to bring these Jews, move these Jews, uh, Jews along? Um, how are you going to get them to this end goal of making them more Jewish? Uh, how are you going to measure success? How are you going to know you're moving people along? Now, this kind of thinking, as you can see here, runs counter to the way Rosenzweig thinks about Jewish learning entirely. If you go in with a pre-programmed, you know, goal, pre predetermined goal, right, you're, you're missing the whole point here. That they can't be approached in that fashion. And Rosenzweig makes a key point. When people show up to learn, it signals this is not just an act of consumerism. We can be cynical and we can say that by going to a lecture, it's no different than going to a movie. But Rosenzweig argues that when Jews come to learn about Judaism or to learn Torah, however we might conceive of it, that that act holds the potential for something more. They are not coming just to be entertained. There's a part of them that wants something more. As Rosenzweig says, it shows 
The Jewish human being is alive in them. Uh, their neshama is looking for something. They want something, even if they don't realize exactly what it is that they're looking for, even if it's difficult for them to put it into words. So for Rosenzweig, the very fact people are going to show up says something about where they can go. But you can't start with the expectation of you know where that's going to lead to, right? So again, to summarize here, we got a moment here with adult Jewish education. This is true today, right? We have a moment, right? Especially now with the pandemic, right? There are people who have time on their hands. They're, they want to be engaged. They want to learn more. My mother, who's uh, Baruch Hashem, been visiting us. My parents have been visiting us in Jerusalem. My mother's telling me she, she listens to way more Shirim than I do because she enjoys it. She's always enjoyed learning, but she has the time now. So we live in this moment where there's this opportunity and, uh, and, and the desire to connect Jewishly, to learn more more Jewishly. But what Rosenzweig is saying, if we really want that to be, uh, to ignite people's souls, to get them to return, we have to keep a couple of things in mind. First, we have to offer this broad array, to be able to present the Jewish what life world and its comprehensiveness. Uh, and number two, we can't go in with a predetermined outcome of where people are going to go. And number three, we have to recognize the very fact that they show up says that they're looking for something more. If you treat people like consumers, that's all they will be. But if you recognize that their desire to, to come and hear that lecture it represents the possibility, at least, that there's some deeper opportunities at play for them, if you recognize that, that opens up a whole different way of thinking about this, um, which is ultimately uh, you know, very, very significant. And this, this really all pushes to the basic fact that for Rosenzweig, learning is about transformation. And this is, um, this is really significant because it actually goes against the way we typically think about learning. I have like a dark secret to share with you. Um, my wife's a longtime educator. I, I've you know, been involved in education for a long time. As much as we say education is supposed to be about transformation, that's really not what it's about at all, 99.9% .9 of the time. And that's true even in religious environments as well. Um, for Rosenzweig, learning always creates the possibility of transformation or reawakening uh, for the Jew to the reality of, of breeds of covenants, um, the covenant that binds them to God and, and, and to their fellow Jews. Um, and this really becomes very clear in this letter that Rosenzweig writes to, uh, uh, to Martin Buber. It's actually one of my favorite letters from Rosenzweig because he, he understands the challenges of being a, a, a real educator. Uh, and in this letter, Rosenzweig speaks very powerfully about the act of teaching as a transformative enterprise and the challenges of, of trying to approach education as a transformative enterprise. Uh, before I read it though, I, I wanna just put Rosenzweig's educational philosophy, his thinking about Torah and Talmud Torah into context, because I would argue that it is both authentically Jewish, uh, but also radical uh, as well. So as I said, typically the dark secret about education is not really about transformation. Even when educators say that it's about like, you know, you know waking people up and transforming people, it's, it's very, very rarely about that. Education, Jewish or not, is traditionally understood as what is sometimes called the banking model, like the bank, like the place you go deposit uh, you know, money that keeps your money, right? And the reason education is really best understood typically as, as like a bank or a banking model is because students are often conceived of as containers or receptacles to be filled by the teacher. The more completely the teacher fills the receptacles of the students, the better the teacher is. And the more passively or the more meekly the receptacle permitted themselves to be filled, right? The more passively the students just like absorb in whatever the teacher has, the better the students are. Education thus becomes an act of depositing in which the students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor. I'm actually citing from a famous educational work called uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, right? Education is about saying, Here's all the stuff you have to learn, memorize it and go past the test and, and move on, right? That's what education is, is primarily uh, 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 about. Instead of communicating, instead of having an honest, authentic communication between the, uh, the teacher and the student, what you find is the teacher's job is to give over information and the student's job is to patiently receive it and memorize it and repeat it and be tested on it and, and move on. Now, in this model, the banking model, the traditional educational model, the teacher is the authority figure. They're the expert. And it's the student's job to submit to their expertise. The teacher knows best and the students 
must do everything they can to absorb the teacher's knowledge. And what this approach tends to be is primarily focused on molding the students in a very specific fashion. So when their education is finished, they can go out and take on their designated role uh, within society. Because in truth, even when schools say they're about transformation, what schools really are about their goal, and this is very much still true today, uh, is to reproduce the status quo, right? Societies create schools mostly to perpetuate the status quo of the society, right? It's to train children to go out there and take their roles on in, in society. Now, with certain kinds of education, this, this banking approach is, is actually really necessary. I mean, I, I mean, Murray, you're a doctor, so you'll appreciate this. When you have to learn a tremendous amount of technical expertise, there's no way to get beyond the banking model, right? People have to absorb a tremendous amount of knowledge to be a doctor. They have to do a lot of repetitive, you know, skill or develop a lot of repetitive skills to be a doctor, right? You just, you can't escape that, this, this ab absorbing all the knowledge and the skills and being molded into being a certain way of being a doctor, right? Being a doctor means, you know, approaching things in a very specific way, a standardized way. Um, and it means carrying a certain identity when you're going off into the world. So this kind of approach is often like important and necessary when you're trying to create certain outcomes and you need to standardize those outcomes. But the problem with this approach when it comes to religious education is that what it tends to do is emphasize conformity, right? It's not about getting teaching people how to think as much as it's about getting them to think a certain way, right? To think and believe and know and act in a, in, in, in a certain fashion. And this you know, happens very, very often in religious education, especially in the Orthodox community today. Most yeshivot, most Orthodox day schools, they have a specific image of what they want their graduates to look like. They have a certain image about what that graduate should know, what that graduate should be doing, what their religious observance should be looking like. And no matter what they tell you about their desire to you know, connect that student to God, what most teachers are doing is judging their success by comparing that student when they graduate to the image that they have in their mind about what the ideal graduate is, um, uh, is, is supposed to look like, right? They, they have this vision, right? Students supposed to be, you know, Shammar Mitzvah, students supposed to be doing this and not doing that and talk like this and spend their time on that, right? Like that's the, 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 the conception and education is about trying to make sure the student matches that um, as, uh, as, as much as possible. And I'll, I'll admit my son here, my oldest son, goes to a very traditional yeshiva, yeshiva, um, and, and it, it fits this in a lot of ways, right? It, what he does, he spends a lot of time learning a lot of material. He spends a lot of time being tested on all this material that he's, that he's, uh, that he's learned. Um, um, and what's success for the school is that the student, like I said, comes out looking and acting in a, in a certain fashion. Um, the banking model relies heavily on conformism and social pressure is often used by the school to push the students to think and act in, in a certain way. The banking model really doesn't care so much about individual freedom. It's not about getting the student to be free and to like choose their own path. Um, instead, it's not about cultivating critical thinking, which might actually be used to question the ideological assumptions of the educational institution, right? It's about creating a certain kind of student. Now, this is very common in religious education. It's very common in secular education. But what Rosenzweig believes is that this cannot be the kind of education that brings people back to, to authentically to Judaism and to Torah. Because if you try to turn the warehouse into a place, like a Kiruv place, right? The way we imagine Kiruv sometimes today, in which like the whole thing is you show up and the Kiruv rabbi, the authority figure is telling you, okay, you wanna learn? This is what a good Orthodox Jew does. This is what a good Orthodox Jew doesn't do. Right, like here's the goal that you need to be working towards, right? That would be completely antithetical to what Rosenzweig was trying to bring about because if, if that's what education looks like, the person who comes to it is not doing it because they have discovered something in Torah and they've connected to something authentic in Torah. They're doing it because the rabbi says so. And that for Rosenzweig, again, defeats the, the whole purpose here. So for Rosenzweig, he sees a very different goal for education and for Torah study. It's not about absorbing knowledge from some expert um, or learning as much material as you can or modeling yourself on some religious you know, teacher. It's about bringing about a transformation of some kind within the student. 
Um, and this is a much greater challenge. It's very easy to teach for a test, right? That's why education has become so standardized today. Because if you make it concrete and objective, you can test for it. Um, it's much easier to teach for a test than it is to teach to try to, like I said, you know, awaken somebody's, uh, awaken somebody's soul. Um, when one teaches with the goal of really waking people up or dramatically changing people's hearts and minds, one must be prepared for the fact that one will rarely be effective. And it can be very disheartening. That's what I was going to point out here in this letter. If you're teaching to wake people up, you're not going to have a whole lot of success. If you're teaching to get people to conform, that's actually much easier. But if you're really trying to wake people up, um, that's going to be hard. Uh, for me, at least, is, for my time as a shul rabbi, uh, I can tell you, I, I completely understand where Rosenzweig is coming from here. There were many times, you know, I would get up there and I'd give a drush and I, I would desperately want people to push themselves a little bit more religiously or spiritually or with their observance. And there'd even be moments where I give this fiery, passionate drush uh, about connecting more deeply or pushing yourselves more deeply. And people would come up to me and say, well, Rabbi, that's such a great drush. I found it so inspiring. And then, you know, a couple of weeks go by and it's pretty clear that the person who said this to me really hadn't made any efforts whatsoever, at least that I could see. And sometimes many weeks or months, like to actually, you know, push themselves or or grow. So if your goal is to wake people up, even if people tell you, "Wow, that was inspiring," it doesn't really mean something is is uh, is, is is happening. Um, and that can make the act of teaching for transformation, like I said, very frustrating. But Rosenzweig hopes to bring about through teaching at the warehouse is, is this more radical transformation one that wakes the learner up to a reality far beyond themselves. And it seeks to bring about a transformation where the learner suddenly recognizes that, that God can be found in Torah and Judaism, right? That there's something deeper drawing them in, something deeper calling to them, that these aren't just texts to be studied or facts to be memorized or practices to be taken on so that the community will accept you. Uh, that religious life isn't simply about learning how to do uh, mitzvot right? That there's always something much bigger at stake uh, at the heart of, uh, of, 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 of religion. And we have to sort of be waken up to the possibility of the moment where that can occur to us in the context of, of learning. And I don't know if you've ever had this, have you ever had a religious teacher that you felt like kind of really just woke you up and enabled you to like see things differently, enabled you to connect to Torah in a, just a deeper, authentic way, not because they were the smartest or the, or the most important rabbi, but there's just something about the words of Torah that came out of their mouth that just hit you in a way unlike anything else. Um, and that's what teaching is, is about. At the very least, what I was going to say here is to, 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 to prepare the possibility of that moment, even if that moment of awakening only happens later, right? The very least teaching wants to at least help lay the groundwork um, for that. So here's what he says to, to Martin Buber. He says, why do we teach? Why do we try to teach? What's going on here? He says, you, you, you know, and I know that in practice, improvement and conversion, both of ourselves and our neighbors, very rarely goes hand in hand with teaching. People rarely transform because of the classroom. Like he says, like, you know this, like we all know this. People transform because they've had some experience somewhere, this or that, but people rarely come back from a class and they say, well, my whole life is, has suddenly changed, right? The change of, for, that comes out of learning, he says, is so rarely at any rate, that it is not worth going to great effort about it, right? If you really look at the success of teaching for transformation, you might think it's not even worth it. Um, immediacy, decisive experience can certainly occur in the course of teaching. People can have an awakening in teaching, but it can equally well occur in the course of lunch. Meaning any kind of experience can be one that's possibly leads to awakening. Why do we think teaching is so important? Um, or education is so important for bringing that about. Because if you're a teacher and you've tried this, you know it's not gonna happen very often with your students. Um, if your goal as a teacher is to bring about a transformation in the life of, of your students, this rarely happens. Transformation can occur, but it can occur just as likely during lunch uh, as it can be uh, because of the learning one does in the classroom. And this can be very disheartening for teachers. And it's part of the reason why many teachers aren't interested in awakening their students, right? It's much easier to teach one's students to pass a test uh, than it is to bring about any real change in them. And, and in most today, there's not even an incentive for teachers to try to bring about a transformation. Um, they'll be punished if they don't like stick to the curriculum. For Rosenzweig, teaching is perhaps best understood not as, as changing your students, but creating the possibility for change, right? Again, it, it's about creating the moments 
so that when they hear God's call to them, as he's going to say, that they're ready to answer it. The kind of spiritual transformation Rosenzweig wants to bring about is best understood as an event, right? Like we're trying to make teaching an event, a moment in the student's life where everything changes for them. What Rosenzweig wants to bring about is a moment like he had, he himself had, when he made the decision to remain Jewish, when he fell in love with his Judaism again. Or as he says in the Star of Redemption, when he heard God call out to him with his proper name, you hear somebody call your name, you just you wake up, you immediately are drawn to it, right? That's the experience that, that, that he wants to bring about with learning. And to be able to be ready in that moment when you hear God call out to you to say, he named me, here I am, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in this, I'm with this, I'm committed to this. Teachers, however, can't make these moments necessarily happen in the Catholic classroom. You can't force them on your students. But what they can do is try to show students how these moments are possible. They can try to awaken their students to the fact that Judaism, the Torah, contains a meaning so much deeper than any they might have previously imagined, if only the student is willing to open themselves up to it. Teaching can lay the groundwork for this. And again, a lot of what teaching is for transformation is pushing your students to realize that however they think the world is, which they often think it's, it's a closed box, right? They, they think they understand the way things are and that's it, right? Teaching is about poking holes in that box to get them to realize there's something beyond their immediate horizons. It's not often necessarily the reason people reason come to, to learn, right? People don't come to education classes to have their bubble burst, right? They come to education classes because they want to feel good about themselves. But part of them is there because they, they want something more. And it's the teacher's job, like I said, to sort of help point them, orient them to, to what may be just beyond their, their horizon. But normally, Rosenstein goes on to say, teaching affects learners only indirectly, only in a preparatory way, removing hindrances only, so to speak, in anticipation. Right? Teaching is always about like setting people up for the, for the future. Um, and in fact, when I think back about the most influential teachers I've had, right, I'm 20 years out of, of college, you know, 23 years out of high school, you know, some of the messages my teachers in high school and my college teachers or my post-college teachers taught me, I don't think I, I fully am internalized until today, right? So this idea that teaching is about preparation is an important one. You, you rarely, as a teacher, see the immediate impact of your, of your teaching, whether it's for transformation or, for, uh, or, or, or not. So that the individual, right, it's all preparation for that moment. So that the individual, when the voice calls to him, will recognize and obey it. Instead of demanding to know who is calling and naturally receiving no answer, not obeying it. So teaching is preparation. It removes hindrances by enabling the student to see themselves in the world in a different light. It's about awakening the student up to a deeper reality, one beyond the surface of things. Most of us live, as I said, in a sort of a closed ideological reality in which society tells us the boundaries of our world, right? We're middle class. That means we're supposed to go get a good education. A life that's considered successful is one in which you get a good job and you get married and you raise a family and you make some money and you're active in your community. And that's, that's what life looks like, right? That's the, the sum total of what life looks like for most of us. Um, that's it. And if you do those things, life's a success. For Rosenzweig, education is not about this stuff at all. It's about, like I said, poking holes in, 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 in the sort of closed box of what these things are to realize that there's something out, outside of it. In fact, education is about getting people to recognize that life is so much bigger than those things. And in Rosenzweig's language, the teaching is preparation for the I, thou moments, right? The, the moment that God calls out to you, the moment that you feel pulled to something and you, you don't know exactly why, but you know it's happening and it's real and you have a desire for it, you feel bound to it, um, and, 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 and you are able to say, yes, you know, I'm here, um, when God calls out to us. Rosenzweig's language um, um, is when we experience something so true that it simply cannot be denied, even if it means recognizing that our lives are, are gonna have to look different by answering this call, by realizing there's something out there that we are drawn to. Education prepares the students so that the, when the moment comes, when that event comes and their world is suddenly bathed with a new, new light, the student is at least open to the possibility of what it might mean rather than simply dismiss, dismiss it out of hand. But Rosenzweig says, in that moment when you feel the call, if you ask, well, if you start asking questions, well, 
why do I want to do this? And what's really going on here? And is this good for my family? If you start asking those questions, there's no answer that you're going to get that's going to be good enough to satisfy you and explain, okay, this is the right decision. Okay, go do this. Oh, there's something there that makes sense, right? That's not the way it works when we hear God's call, right? To answer God's call is always a, a moment of profound uncertainty because it means being sort of wrenched free from the situation that you're in right now. And the situation that you're in right now comes with all these reasons and justifications, right? Like I do this because of this. I am that because of that. When God's call comes and you feel yourself drawn to something bigger and greater, that's a moment that's, that's, that's uh, destabilizing, right? You suddenly don't know exactly where you belong because whatever was going on before isn't exactly what defines your world anymore. And what teaching tries to do is to recognize that in these moments that we can say yes to it. Um, that we that they're, they're not illusory. They're not these like delusions that happen to us. What teaching tries to do is lay the groundwork for recognizing the call and at least begin to provide the tools so that the student will be able to answer it. This is the essence of, of covenant, right? When you fall in love, if you start asking yourself, well, why am I falling in love here? Does, my, does this woman deserve it? Is she pretty? Is she not pretty? Is he handsome or not? Is he, start asking yourself all these questions like you're done. That's the death of love, right? If you feel the call of love, right? The only question you have to answer is like, am I able to say, it? like, I love you back, right? Like, that's the only question. That's the only question that you can really answer in, in that moment. And teaching is about getting you to be able to say, I love you back when you, when, you, when you feel that call of love or that summons of love speaking out to you. Um, this is the essence of breed of covenant. And if in prayer we speak to God, uh, then in Torah study, in Talmud Torah, we have the potential of hearing God's call to us. Torah awakens our connections to the divine thou that manifests again in these different dimensions in halacha, in the home, in synagogue, in a life of mitzvot. And again, in all of these dimensions, you have the possibility of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, hearing, uh, of hearing God's call. Um, Rosenzweig concludes the letter. He says, what does take place, I must repeat in, in teaching, in education for transformation, is preparation, clearing the path, house building. Granted, sometimes worthless phantoms will walk the path and move into the house. Does that make the building useless labor? So teaching is in many ways about trying to point the student beyond their frame of reference. They think the world's one way and the teacher's trying to show them that it can be more, um, to show them that the impossible is in a sense possible. Uh, teaching is about building a home so that someone can move into it. Um, in this context, teaching is, is inherently kind of like an act of faith, um, which I think is very profound uh, for both in both the students, you have to have faith in the student that they have the potential to be transformed. And you have to have faith in the Torah that it can be transformative, right? Because again, you're most likely not going to see the results of this uh, in, the, in the here and now. Um, so again, all of this, and, and, and I know these are like very, you know, sort of um, uh, grand ways of thinking about this, but this is the goal of the Lair House. Everything I'm trying to lay out here, he's trying to wake Jews up. He's trying to wake Jews up to the power of Torah. And he's trying to get them ready so that when they hear that moment of God's call, and again, it's not a literal moment of prophecy, but it is a moment in which they are potentially falling in love with Torah, and then, of course, falling in love with God and the Jewish people, that when that moment comes to them in the midst of learning, because learning always has that potential, um, that they're able to say yes to it, that they're able to say, I love you back, right? Um, that's the goal of the, uh, of, of, of the Lair House. So that, that's, that's point one. Learn our house, Torah study for transformation. Not Torah study to learn as many masechot as you can or learn all the details of halacha, right? Those things are to a certain extent important, but it's not the goal that he has in mind for the warehouse. It's not the primary goal for a Jew who's, who's hopefully potentially on, their, on the path of, uh, of return. Um, the next idea I wanted to focus on with the, with the Lair house is again, what, what does this look like in practice? And uh, um, here's how Rosenzweig uh, describes it. What's going to really go on the last? How is the learning there going to be different than what might happen in a university, let's say? So he says to begin with, and when it comes to the learning, the education, don't offer them anything. Listen, and words will come to the listener and they will join together and form desires. And desires are the messengers of confidence. So again, I know so much of Rosenzweig sounds a bit obscure, but we have to sort of understand what he's, what he's trying to say here. And the key word in this opening part here is desire. Um, what does this mean, right? Again, he says, don't show up in the warehouse with like your lesson plan and like, okay, I'm here to give my lecture, right? That's not what the warehouse is about. He says, first, listen, and the words will come to the listener. You got to come, you got to show up 
and you got to let them talk. And why is it so important to let the student talk? Because the student is coming to the learning from a place of desire. And if you come with your lecture, you snuff out that desire, right? We have to cultivate desire. If you want learning to be transformative, it has to be an environment in which desire is allowed to, um, uh, to flourish. Um, again, so what, is this, what does this mean? Um, it doesn't mean, as it is often conceived of today, that students are consumers who the teachers should just cater to. That's not what Rosenzweig is saying. He's not saying here, listen to the students to see what they want because we've got to give them what they want. That's, that's, that's not what he means. I think desire here is best understood in a more psychoanalytic sense. And what exactly is desire in a psychoanalytic sense? Well, Jacques Lacan, who is probably the most important psychoanalytic thinker after Freud, famous French psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst um, argues that desire always comes from a place of lack. Um, that because we're lacking something, we desire something. And, and we kind of know this from, from our own experience, right? We always want what we don't have. And the moment we're told that we can't have something is often exactly the moment that we want it, right? And you've probably heard the, it's, it's actually a verse, I think, in Mishle, right? There's, you know, there, nothing is sweet as forbidden fruit, right? The, the fact that you are lacking something is what makes you often, uh, you know, desire it um, in, in some way. And it's our, it's our lack that actually creates this desire that pulls us towards the things that um, uh, we desire. And in truth, we often have desires we are not fully aware of um, and can't always even quite articulate, right? Something about desire that as much as we try to say it's located in an object, right? Desire always kind of pushes on to something more. And we know this because every time you really desire something, the moment you finally get that object, you know, you suddenly want something else, right? There's something about desire that is, it doesn't, it's almost unextinguishable. It's always pushing um, for more and for, 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 for beyond, right? I'll just point out, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov writes a lot about the importance of desire. He actually says that the um, Ikar does is the Ratzon. The essence of, uh, of, of serving God is Ratzon is desire. Because even if you, even if it's like you, even if you can't pray with Kavanah, but if you at least want to pray, if you're like oriented towards prayer, if you're oriented towards God, even if you can't like get the words out in a spiritual way, that already is maybe the whole battle, right? There's something about desire that pushes us beyond ourselves um, towards um, uh, something more. What, what makes desire such a powerful force is that to desire something is to recognize that one's current situation is lacking. It's incomplete, right? That's why we desire it. If students come to the warehouse, and demonstrate a genuine desire uh, for learning, for Torah, this needs to be cultivated because what it represents is a recognition that their current existence as German Jews is lacking in some way. Meaning it's their lack of knowledge, their lack of understanding of Ju Judaism that is drawing them here on some level, which means there's like an opening to something more. It means that they, 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 they know there's more to their Judaism than, than, than what is, and they want to try to fill that, that, that lack in, in, in some way. Um, uh, something in Judaism, something they don't quite have is drawing them in. Desire is the engine that creates the possibility of transformation. It's what leads me beyond where I am now to pursue something that might be totally different. Remember I said, desire, if, if the job of education is to poke holes in your sort of ideological box to get you to realize there's something outside of it, once those holes are there, desire leads you beyond, right? Because desire is like, well, wait a second, there's something out there. What is that? Is it is something meaningful, something holy, something transcendent? What's going on here, right? Like that's, that's what desire is, you know, helps us, um, is the engine for. Um, uh, this is actually reflected in Jewish teachings in the Gemara. There's a famous line in the Gemara, Ein adam lo made, ele um, that a person only learns from the place that their heart desires which is like really fascinating, right? That learning, again, which seemingly is the kind of transformative learning that Rosenzweig is talking about here. Um, this is where Chazal are very much with Rosenzweig, is that this, this desire for, for Torah, right? For something more, for something beyond, for something you can't quite grab, but you know is out there, right? That that is where, what, what ultimately is the, is the engine for, for real learning. Um, you see something you don't understand, you want to learn more. You look at the Torah, the Jewish tradition, and you recognize there's something there you don't have, something that calls to you. For Chazal, desire for Torah is even an erotic thing, right? Like that's what eroticism is, right? Like you, it, what's erotic is not the naked body. What's erotic is the body that's partially covered. 
because you know there's something there underneath, even though you can't quite like see it yet, right? So that's the idea with, with learning. You, you desire Torah exactly because you don't even know what's fully there, but you know there's something there uh, and you're drawn to it. And it's the job of the teacher to cultivate that desire, to, to allow it to become greater and greater uh, for real learning and, and real transformation uh, to, ultimately, um, um, to ultimately take place. Um, and if you don't cultivate desire, you won't have this possibility of transformation because the alternative is you just, you can extinguish desire with like just a bunch of facts, just with a charismatic teacher who people are drawn to, but it's really about the teacher and it's not about the students, right? Rosenzweig doesn't want it to be that way. For Rosenzweig, it's about the student, not about the teacher. And everybody in the layer has the potential to be a student. Teachers are always potentially students, as he's going to point out here. Um, he goes on and because he, he notes that cultivating desire in education is always risky because it's, again, kind of opening the door to all sorts of questions, all sorts of possibilities. He says, for who knows whether desires such as these, real spontaneous desires of the students, not artificially nurtured by some scheme of education, right? Most education works through like marketing and trying to convince the students this is what's important and generates desire artificially, right? When you generate authentic desire, who knows can be, if it can, it can be satisfied or not, right? Do you have the tools to get the student to, to where they wanna go? But those who know how to listen to the real wishes of their students may also know how to point out the desired way, right? A teacher has to be a profoundly sensitive, insightful, thoughtful person because they've got to be this kind of transformative teacher They've got to listen to their student. They've always got to be able to look inside their psyche and have a sense of what is it they want and where is it that they really want to, um, uh, where is it that they really want to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to go. Um, this will be the hardest task of all. For the teacher able to satisfy such spontaneous desires cannot be a teacher according to a plan. You must be much more and much less, a master and at the same time a pupil, right? Again, Judaism doesn't have recipes, which means teachers can't have lesson plans which means the teacher has to engage in what Rosenzweig would call a dialogical experience. It's gotta be an open dialogue, a conversation. Teacher's gonna talk, student's gonna ask questions, teacher's gonna ask questions, student's gonna respond, right? It's, it's, a, it's a dialogue, a spontaneous engagement um, that enables the possibility for something new, something beyond to, to, ultimately, uh, to ultimately emerge. And it's very difficult because most teachers, most educators are attracted to education because it's a place in which they get to be the master, right? I'm the one who knows, student has to come and listen to me, right? Like that's the way that a lot of reason a lot of people are drawn to education. That's not the model in the warehouse. The warehouse is you're not a teacher to be bowed down to or for everybody to go, ooh, you know so much, right? You in the, as a teacher in the warehouse are as much also as a student. Because if you don't know how to be a student, it means you don't, you aren't even aware of your own desires. And to teach and to cultivate the desire of the other you have to be in tune with your own desires. You have to be in tune with your own sense of the way in which Torah exceeds your grasp, the way you're not a master of Torah, how there's always more to Torah than what you understand and that you have questions and that you're continuously drawn back to it again and again on your own. And if you don't have that kind of relationship to Torah, then there's no way to cultivate that with your, with your students. Um, he says, uh, uh, it will not be enough that the teacher himself knows uh, of, that, that, uh, of that he himself can teach. He must be capable of something quite different. He must be able to desire, right? The teacher has to be able to desire Torah uh, and Judaism. Uh, he who can desire must be the teacher here. I mean, a lot of teachers, like they, they, they sort of act like they love Judaism, but they love it in a very, in a very um, defined way. They love their Ju version of Judaism, right? Judaism for them, Torah for them is not, this, this thing that opens up to all these possibilities that they don't yet know. What they love about Torah is they can tell you exactly what Torah is, right? Like one of the things I hate, one of my pet peeves is these rabbis that use this term like Torah true. Like there's a Torah true way of X or a Torah true way of Y. And I just hate that language whatsoever because it assumes that the Torah is fundamentally defined in a certain way, right? This is what the Torah true X way of doing things looks like. Like there, there is no Torah true, right? Like the whole idea of Torah of, of, of the words of Torah is that they're always open to uh, interpretive possibilities, right? The Rambam famously says, the gates of interpretation are, are never closed. And if that's the case, then there can't be a Torah true way of anything, right? Absolutely defining black and white, this is what it is, right? This is what the Torah says, this is what you've got to submit to, right? That can't be an authentic relationship to Torah. 
The teacher in the lair house is the one who has their own desire in Torah. Torah is as enigmatic for them. It's as mysterious for them on a certain level as it is for the students. The only difference between the teacher and the student is that the teacher understands that. And the teacher recognizes what their relationship is to the Torah in that way, that it calls to them, that it draws them in, that it has more meaning there. The student doesn't yet recognize that, right? But it's the teacher's job to show them how the student can, can, ultimately, uh, can ultimately get there. Um, he who can desire must be the teacher. The teachers will be discovered in the same discussion room and the same discussion period as the students. And in the same discussion hour, the same person may be heard as both master and student. Uh, in fact, only when this happens will it become certain that a person is qualified to teach. How do you know when a person is really a teacher? Is when they know when they not that they know how to be a student, like you know how to sit there nicely and ask questions, but when they authentically know what it means to be a student. When they ask a question, not because they're just participating, right? Like I've seen this sometimes. Very learned people will sit in on a shear and they'll like ask a question because like that's the polite thing to do to participate politely. That's not what he's like talking about here. He's talking about teachers who become students. They become as curious. They become as self-aware of what they don't know. They become excited, right? Like about what they can learn, right? That's what it means for, for a teacher to actually be a, uh, a student. The expert thinks they have all the answers, but in the Lair House, that's a problem because the teacher needs to fulfill their role from a place of desire as well. They too must desire Torah. There must be questions that bother them, things they don't know, they too are on a journey and not simply Jews who have reached the destination. This is important for the students. If the teachers are experts, the authority figures, then all the students has to say to themselves is, if I truly want to become Jewish, I should just be like the teacher. But that's if the teachers are experts or master. Uh, the student will try to gain recognition from the teacher by doing what the teacher wants. Right? I, I'm sure, I'm going to pick on Murray again. I'm sure you had a lot of medical students over the years in one capacity or another. They're doing things in no small part because they want to please you because you're the authority figure, you're the expert, you, you're, you, know, you run the place, right? Like if that's, the, if that's what students are drawn to, again, that actually closes the door on, um, on, on the kind of transformation that this wants to bring about. Because again, you can't become Jewish because somebody you respect is Jewish and you want to be like them. That, that, that again, defeats the purpose here. Um, uh, the transformation Rosenzweig wants to, uh, to bring about can't be compelled. Um, one can't become more Jewish simply to please a rabbi or gain acceptance by a community or by an authority figure. It must be, in a sense, something one freely chooses, uh, if only so that one will come to understand that it was never really a choice all along. Uh, it was always something that was part of them. Rosenzweig doesn't choose to remain Jewish because a rabbi tells him to or because he will make others happy. Uh, he chooses to remain Jewish at the very moment when he has no reason to at all. Um, because he feels like that's just who he is. So to summarize, the Lair House is not a place to come and be entertained, and it's not a place to come and absorb information or Torah. Uh, it's a place to come if one has questions, if one is seeking a deeper meaning in their Judaism, if one has a desire for Torah, even if they don't know what that means. The teacher is not an expert in the Lair House, rather they too are a student in the sense that they desire to learn more, they don't have all the answers. They too find themselves bothered by questions. Only teachers like this can be sensitive to the desires of their students and cultivate those desires to the very possibility that the engagement with Torah can be transformative, that they can hear God call to them within the text, and that the call can ultimately be heard within all the dimensions of their life, right? You don't just hear God in the Torah, but you hear God potentially in, in any moment. Only teachers who aren't presented as authority figures for the students can create the space, the free space for their students to really choose who they are and recognize ultimately who they have always been. So in the, uh, in the time we have remaining here, which isn't much, I want to just, uh, or a little bit later than I thought. Do we, I'm gonna, do you want me to stop or you guys got five minutes? We've got five minutes. Okay. So the, uh, I, I wanna do one, one more part of the way Rosenzweig conceives of the return to Judaism through, um, through Torah study. Uh, so we saw the, the earlier part of this essay uh, before, um, and it relates to a very significant argument uh, Rosenzweig makes here about the nature of Torah study at the Lair House. Um, he noted before in the earlier part of this essay uh, that there is no longer a connection between life and Torah. It used to be that Jewish life and Torah were organically intertwined. You study Torah, you live the Jewish life, each one spoke to the other. 
The problem is with modernity, with secularization, with people no longer being religious, suddenly the Torah is coming from a very different place than where people are living their lives. Instead of Torah and life being interconnected, you have Torah and life being fundamentally separated. Um, and as Jewish life has become distant from Torah, because Jews are now immersed in, in an alien world and foreign knowledge, they're coming from a very different place. And this dissonance, this disconnect between Torah and their world is a real problem because historically the whole, what held the, if, let me put it this way, if the Jewish world was built on the home, the synagogue and halacha, like kind of all around it, then Torah was the, the life force that held all those pieces together uh, because it could speak to all those pieces. But once your world doesn't really connect to Torah in an obvious manner, right, then you have, what is it that's actually holding all that together? Um, so what, what do we do now when the Jewish world is so distant from Torah? So he says here, learning the old form of maintaining the relationship between life and the book, right? Like that was what Talmud Torah did is it linked life and Torah has failed. Um, has it really? Well, wait a second, Rosa Spike says. There, there, you might think there's an impenetrable wall between Torah and the world in modernity, but that, that can't be the case. It's only the form of Torah study has to a certain extent no longer allows it to be like it used to, this organic mix. Um, it is now as it has always been. We draw new strength from the very circumstance that seemed to deal the death blow to learning. From the desertion of our scholars to the realms of alien knowledge of the outside books, meaning from the liberal Jewish world, all the Torah scholars are just academics. They're no longer traditional Torah scholars. From the transformation of our erstwhile Tamir Chachamim into the instructors and professors of modern European universities, a new learning is about to be born. Rather, it has been born. So what is this new learning that's been born when Torah and, 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 and the world and life have become so separate? So here's the, the, what Rosenzweig says, and it's, it's very insightful um, because it's so true. He says, it is a learning in a reverse order, a learning that no longer starts from the Torah and leads into life, but the other way around. From life, from a world that knows nothing of, of the law of halacha or pretends to know nothing, back to Torah. That is the sign of the time. So if in the pre-modern Jewish world, you studied Torah and then you, that, you lived your life according to Torah, right? Like Torah leads to life. We no longer have that authentic connection. So for us, it's the other way around. We start with our lives, our often very secular alienated lives that are distant from Judaism. And then we turn back to the Torah, right? And that is a very different experience because when you start with the Torah, the Torah shapes your view of life. But when you start with life, that means life shapes your view on the Torah. That when you return to the Torah as a secular person, the way you look at Torah is going to be different than what a, you know, a religiously born person is going to see when they look at Torah. And for Rosenzweig, this is not seen as something that's like a, uh, um, um, again, like a descent or a down, the downfall, like, a, oh my God, like, you know, we, we can't learn like we used to. He sees, you know, profound possibilities uh, within this that the new Torah study does not mean an attempt simply to mimic traditional text study, Torah study, as it was done before. Rather, it means bringing back non-Jewish life with us in the return to Torah. Or we saw this before with Rosenzweig, you can't tear the, apart the German from the Jew, he says, um, that there's, it's like part of him, you know, you can't, you can't go back to the ghetto, um, but what you can do is return to Torah. But returning as a German Jew, as an American Jew, as a secular Jew to Torah means you're going to bring that Americanness, that secularness, that Germanness to your perspective on Torah. And it's going to impact how you look at Torah. And for Rosenzweig, that may be what actually allows the Torah ultimately to be holy for us. Um, uh, he, he goes on to say here, uh, he says, uh, one second. Um, he says that. Uh, it is learning in reverse order, a learning that no longer starts from Torah, but the other way around, right? This is the sign of the time. This is a new uh, sort of, uh, of Torah learning uh, for which in these days, he is the most apt who brings with the maximum of what is alien, which is fascinating, right? The, the, the Torah study that we're trying to do today, what, what makes it most holy is when you come from the farthest distance from Judaism, when you bring the most that isn't Jewish with you. That is to say, not the man specializing in Jewish matters, 
or if he happens to be such a specialist, he will not succeed, not in the capacity of a specialist, but only as one who too is alienated, as one who is groping his way home. That you actually can only be successful in Torah study today when you come with your full self, your full like non-Jewish self that you bring uh, to Torah with you. That when you bring it back to Torah, it changes the way you look at Torah and that non-Jewish part of yourself actually becomes elevated. It actually becomes part of Torah, so to speak, right? It enables you to look at Torah in a different way, to find new meaning in Torah. And that in itself is like the essence of Torah study. That's what makes Torah study so powerful, right? The traditional Jew who starts with the Torah and then turns to life and life is meant to mimic Torah, for them, they tend to view the Torah through this somewhat narrow uh, ideological lens. Um, they kind of like are just going to repeat what they've heard. It's sort of like a circular thing, right? What they learned is how they're going to see Torah. But when you come to Torah with this foreignness, with this strangeness, right? It enables you to see all these things in Torah that nobody else can see. Uh, and that for Rosenzweig is what the new Talmud Torah is for the Jew who's returning to Judaism. And it's something that's very, 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 very powerful. Um, so why is this? This idea that we, instead of going from Torah to life, we go from life uh, to Torah. Why not just tell these people to abandon everything for Torah? Right? Why, why, wait, hold up. Why, what are you saying? Bringing your, your Germanness, your Americanness, your secularism back with you. That stuff's trade. That stuff's not holy. Get rid of it. Just cut it out of you. So, why does Rosenzweig not only say you got to bring it, but that it's actually essential to bring it, that it can actually elevate Torah? So, number one, I think it's important to realize that if you don't bring that back with you because it's part of you, there's no way to make Torah real. Um, you really don't have a choice. Right? If you don't bring back the life that you have, it can't turn Torah into a Torah to met, a Torah of truth. But right? if you have to like deny all these parts of yourself when you return to Torah and pretend like you're not there, how can the Torah be true for you, right? That's, that's point number one. And then point number two, as I said before, Torah has no absolute final defined meaning. It's always open to interpretation. That's why, and, and the Ramban says this, Nachmanides says this, right? When you open up a state for Torah, there are words. But those words lack vowels and punctuation, which means you never really know how to read them and you never really know what they can mean, right? It means they're always open to multiple possibilities of meaning, right? That's why our Sefer and Torah don't have vo vocalization or punctualization. There's always that possibility uh, for more meaning, right? Shivim Panim the Torah, there's 70 faces of Torah. Um, so because Torah has no absolute final defined meaning, um, then when we come back to Torah with these foreign parts of ourselves, there's always more meaning to be had in Torah. Uh, it means that one can return to Torah with a radically different perspective and still invest that Torah with authentic meaning, with holding meaning, because of the new and different perspective that one, that one brings to it. And that is uh, profoundly um, uh, important. Right, maybe the classic example of this from the Talmud is Reish Lakish. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Reish Lakish is a, a, either like a gladiator or a brigand, and he encounters Rabbi Yochanan, and he decides that he wants to become a Torah scholar. And he gives up his formal, former way of life, which was not a very Jewish way of life, and he becomes a, a great Torah scholar. Um, and, and, and he actually brings this knowledge and understanding that he used to have from these, his not-so-moral efforts to his Torah study. Um, in fact, there's a famous statement by Reish Lakish in the Gemara, where Reish Lakish says that when you, the tshuva has the power to transform intentional sins into merits, right? That the Torah, the tshuva has the power to transform intentional sins into merits. You can do all these things that are bad, that are genuinely bad, intentionally bad, but tshuva has the power to transform them into something good, right? Like that to an extent is what the model is here of bringing your full self, turning into your full self again as German, as modern, as American, as secular, whatever it is, right? That it has the ability to allow you to look at Torah in a new way, to find new meaning within it, um, and to sanctify that, um, uh, that, that, that part of yourself. And I'll just um, uh, finish here um, with a, uh, a, a, a piece of, uh, well, I'll do two pieces real quick. He, the piece here from Rodzvai concludes, and he offers like a bracha for the students. This is from the opening of Blair House. He gives a, a very special lecture. He says, may the hours you spend here become hours of remembrance, but not in the stale sense of a dead piety that is so frequently the attitude toward Jewish matters. I want you to learn Torah here 
and I want it to be an active memory of remembrance, but not the way we typically think about it. Typically, memory in Judaism is like, oh, uh, let's remember what like our grandparents did. Oh, right, let's like, you know, hold on to these, you know, his, the history of Judaism, right? That's not what Rosenzweig has in mind when he wants, he doesn't want Torah study to be in an ethnic, um, an ethnic recreation or a, uh, oh, I want to remember like what Jewish life was like on the Lower East Side, right? That's not what, it's not nostalgia. That's not what he wants it to be. Um, I mean, hours of another kind of remembrance, an inner remembrance, a turn from externals to that which is within, a turning that, believe me, will and must become for you a returning home. Turn into yourself, return home to your innermost self and your innermost life, right? Torah learning for Rosenzweig is about tshuva. This idea of tshuva is for him return, right? If you study Torah, if you hear God's call, as we talked about before, you're looking the other way, you hear somebody call you, you turn around to see them, to respond, right? That's the tshuva that bring, is brought up by Torah study. You, you can't help but turn around when you hear that call to face Torah and, and, and face God, but it's, a, it's an act of memory, meaning for this way, you're born a Jew. You're always a Jew. You always have a relationship to Judaism and to Torah and to God. The question is like whether you can wake up and, and realize that. And there's a very beautiful Gemara uh, in Mesechet Nida, and you may have heard this before, while the baby is inside its mother's belly, it learns the entire Torah, right? Very beautiful idea. It spends all those nine months learning the entire Torah. When the baby is born, however, an angel comes out and smacks it on the, the mouth and it forgets the whole Torah. Now you might ask, what the heck is the point of learning all the Torah only to forget it? That seems to kind of be like a waste of time. Um, but Rav Soloveitchik actually points out here is that the reason we learn the entire Torah only to forget it is so that when we learn forevermore, we're really remembering. Meaning every time we learn Torah, we're actually remembering because we used to know all of Torah when we were, before we, we entered into this, uh, into this world. Um, and that's the idea that Rosenzweig is getting at, that we have this inextricable connection to Torah. It, it, Torah was God's call to the Jewish people, right? It, it, we're born into that, right? We were at Sinai, right? We are part of this, uh, whether we like it or, or, or not. And the last thing I'll say, just to bring it back to Hanukkah, and I appreciate you giving me a, a few extra minutes here. Um, statement by Rabbi Nachman of Reslov. Uh, he notes um, when it comes to, to Hanukkah and to Bali Chuba, he says as follows. He says, he's, this is a part of a much larger piece, but what he emphasizes here is how is it that God's name is going to be glorified? Well, he cites the Zohar, and it's the Zohar says, when the other nations come and recognize God, then the name of God ascends and is glorified above all people. Right? If we really want to sanctify God's name, it's not just enough for Jews to be drawn to God. It's about the non-Jewish nations being drawn to God. That's obviously the messianic vision. Right? All the nations come to Jerusalem to worship and acknowledge God. Right? That's, that's what it means for God's name to be sanctified. For those who are most distant to come to uh, God, and that's why the example of Yitro he cites here, right? Yitro wasn't Jewish. It was a Midianite. Come and acknowledges God and God's name after, after Harsinai, and that's a very important moment. Uh, Rabbi Nachman goes on, he says, we find therefore that in his glory, um, that this is his glory, when people who are outside holiness draw closer to the realm of holiness. This applies equally to the converts and to the Bali Tshuva, for they were also on the outside, right? And when the converts and the Bali Tshuva are drawn, and closer, drawn closer and brought inside, this is God's glory. But it's when those who are distant come back, those who had, didn't have a connection, suddenly are able to express that, that truth of God in their lives and in the world, that's what glorifies God, right? That's in no small part why the Baal Tshuva idea that Rahun Swag is talking about here, he sees them, it's not just that he wants to save some Jewish souls. He sees the act of these German Jews returning to Judaism as in itself almost a messianic act. He says this in certain places, right? Because to take that which is most distant and show how it was always connected to God, right? that cannot help but sanctify God's name, right? The definition of sanctifying God's name is to be somewhere you don't think God is and to realize God was there the whole time, right? The, because God's presence is, is ever present. Um, and Rabbi Nachman connects this to Hanukkah. He says, this corresponds to the mitzvah of the Hanukkah candle. There's a requirement to light it next to the entrance of the home. That's where ideally you're supposed to light Hanukkah candles at the doorway. This is because lighting the candle corresponds to the illumination of the glory, of God's glory. As in the earth was illuminated by his glory, the mitzvah therefore is to light it next to the entrance of the home. This is the supernal entrance corresponding to fear, the returning of the glory to its source, which is fear as mentioned above, right? We light the Hanukkah candle 
at the outer edge of our home, at the precipice, at the threshold between our home and that which is beyond the home, right? We light the Hanukkah candle to bring light to the darkness, right? The Hanukkah candle is representative here of the Bali Chuba, right? To take that which is beyond, that which is outside of Judaism or foreign or disconnected and to bring God's light to it. That's what the Bali Chuba does. That's what the return to Judaism does. And as I said, in that sense, it's a messianic act. It's a transformative act, not just for the individual, not just even for, for Jews, because when other Jews see the Bali Chuba, it enables them to recognize God's presence um, God's call in places that the religious Jew didn't see it before, because the religious Jew looks at the secular Jew and says, you know, there's no God there. But when the secular Jew is able to answer God's call, then the religious Jew realizes the, 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 religion, the holy possibilities that were always there. Right. That's what Rosenzweig is ultimately aspiring to here. Uh, and again, he sees Torah learning as the primary way to to bring that about. But it's not going to be just going to classes or learning facts or reading books. It's got to be a Torah learning that is pushing towards transformation of expanding our horizons, of orienting ourselves to what's beyond our world or beyond our way of thinking about the world rather than just the way we typically conceive of it. Uh, it's a Torah learning that's founded on desire uh, of recognizing what we don't have and what's out there still awaiting us, both in the Torah and beyond. Um, and it's about teachers who know how to be students, teachers who know how to cultivate desire, teachers who know how to prepare their students for that event when God calls out to them. Um, and lastly, it, it's Torah learning in which you return to Torah. You bring that part of yourself that seems not Jewish to Torah. Um, we didn't used to do that as Jews. We used to, like I said, start from Torah, go to the world. Now we bring the world to Torah. And that's not something that's, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, some concession, right? That actually, by bringing our full selves to Torah, the non-Jewish part of ourselves, the modern part of ourselves to Torah, it actually enables us to find new meaning of Torah and elevate it. And again, when you bring holiness to that which wasn't holy before, um, that ultimately sanctifies God's name. And that's ultimately what, what the holiday of Hanukkah is all about.